Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest LPL Market Signals podcast. Jeff Bookbinder here with my friend and colleague, Lawrence Gillum. Lawrence, how are you today? Oh, I'm doing great, Jeff. Uh, happy to be back on the podcast. We're glad to have you back. I, I've said it before, when you, you put your stock guy and your bond guy together, it just it just makes sense, right? It's, we, ma it's magical. We, it's magical. We complement each other well. Diversifiers, you and I. All good stuff. So um, after we look at these lovely disclosures, uh, let's get into our um, agenda. It is Monday, July 17th, 2023, as we're recording this. And this will be out and available to all of you on Tuesday. So um, agenda first, we're just going to recap last week, as we always do. The NASDAQ had its best week since March. Uh, the S&P was really close to doing the same, but there was a week in June. I think it was right in the middle of the month where the S&P was just as strong. So we'll call it the second best week for the S&P since March. Um, we're going to talk about earnings season Q2. Our earnings need to be quite good, we think, to keep this market going higher. Uh, the reason we are happy to have Lawrence here is we're going to talk about high yield bonds. You certainly don't want to hear about high yield bonds from your equity guys. So we're going to talk high yield, which has actually been doing pretty well here lately. At least that's what Lawrence tells me. And then uh, lastly, preview the week ahead. It's going to be a big week of earnings, of course, with some really big names, but uh, only about 60 companies. So I think retail sales will still get uh, plenty of attention in addition to digesting the Chinese data that we just got. So let's get into it. Um, starting with market recap, um, here you see the performance table uh, for last week. And um, you know, we haven't color coded this, but if we made this, you know, green up, red down, there would be a ton of green on here uh, because, you know, the S&P 2.4% last week, NASDAQ 3.3%, Russell 2000 small cap index even better, uh, up 3.6%. And then you go down to the sectors um, or go over to the sectors, I should say, every sector higher, right? Defensives, cyclicals, natural resources, growth, value, everything. Uh, now, uh, you know, normally we we talk sectors first because that's where you tend to get the most dispersion. But Lawrence, we got a big downdraft in the dollar uh, last week, and that propped up uh, international equities. So, um, you know, you see here Europe up three and a half percent. If you look at the um, the EFA and the emerging market indexes in dollars, you got you know close to five percent returns uh, for the EFA and, and that for EM. So. Um, Really strong returns overseas. So, Lawrence, any uh, any comments on that? Either the the dollar piece or or any of these indexes that that jump out at you? Well, I just think that the breadth of of winners last week and how normally you see winners and losers when uh, when you when you look at these performance figures. But it was such I think a relief perhaps after the CPI data came in weaker than expected that we saw markets rally across both the equity and fixed income markets. It was it was a good week last week. Yes, you'll see the fixed income returns in a second. They were really strong as yields came down, celebrating the good inflation numbers. I mean, if you just walk through the news last week, nothing really mattered even as even close <laughs> to as much as the um, as the CPI reading, which was quite better than expected. Uh, even the earnings, the earnings were were fine for the most part, uh, but um, we didn't really see a lot of huge moves off of the earnings uh, reports that we got uh, last week. So let, let's keep moving. Um, so um, I'll hit commodities real fast, uh, Lawrence, and then you can hit the bond. So we've been seeing a pickup here. Here's the weak dollar story again. You're seeing a lot of that in the financial press. Um, industrial metals up over 4%, precious metals up over 3%. When the dollar falls, you tend to see metals move uh, even more than, than crude oil. Uh, or natural gas. Uh, so you got the international equities and metals uh, enjoying uh, certainly a, uh, a very strong week. And then over the bonds, Lawrence, more gains. Yep, more gains, which we're happy to see. You know, we've talked about this in our, our mid-year outlook presentations that maybe the first half of the year wasn't uh, in line with a lot of expectations for, for fixed income investors. You know, I, I we've talked about too, that once the Fed is done, we're likely to see yields lower and we had that first kind of initial reaction to lower CPI last week, and maybe the, the Fed is getting closer to being done raising rates. So 
Uh, we, we did see yields fall across the curve last week. I think the, the 10 year treasury yield was down about 30 basis points. It was above 4%. Now it's around 3.8 something percent as we're recording this. So the, uh, kind of a re relief rally across sectors. Treasuries were, were uh, positive for the week. Mortgage-backed securities, which is that that uh, sector that we still prefer over a lot of these other core bond sectors. But high yield uh, was was positive for the week. Emerging market debt. So, I mean, anywhere you were invested last week was, except for the, I think, Brazil was the only area of, of, that, we're, that we've shown that was that was negative on the week. But for the most part, it was a really good week to be invested last week. Yeah, I guess certainly if you were in non-dollar uh, Europe, for example, maybe you didn't do so well. <laughs> but but other than investing outside of the U.S. Uh, dollar, you, uh, you you did well, absolutely. So um, as you can talk about more in a bit, Lawrence, um, you know, LPR Research continues to like bonds slightly more than equities uh, for the rest of the year. You saw that in our mid-year outlook. Uh, but certainly we think you can get you know positive returns out of both uh, between now and year end. Uh, so let, let's look at the S and P as we always do. Although um, I put a different twist on it, you know, putting on my uh, my technician hat. Uh, so I see I show the S P 100 chart on the top here, which um, you know, as we say, seemingly every week we've got this uptrend, higher highs, higher lows, but maybe we're a little bit overbought, at least in the short term. Um, it, on the bottom panel, I put the percentage of stocks above the 200-day moving average. This is in response to all the concern about the um, narrow leadership, right? And you know, a lot of people talking about how it's just, you know, the magnificent seven, you know, the biggest seven stocks in the S&P driving most of the gains. And that's true, you know, for the year that's that's where we've been. Uh, but it actually is starting to broaden out. We saw, you saw it just last week with small caps doing better. Uh, we started to see performance for industrials get a little bit better, uh, for example. And then now you see just, you know, the number of stocks that are in and kind of an intermediate to long term uptrend is rising. So I think this, you know, counters the argument that, um, you know, it's just a small group of stocks working. Now, on that note, um, the NASDAQ 100 is going to be doing a uh, rebalance next week that is actually going to move around some of the weights of some of these big tech names. I believe, um, according to numbers from Goldman Sachs, we're going to get about an eight-point haircut in the um, in the weighting of the mega caps in the Nasdaq 100 index. Uh, that's a pretty big haircut. They're trying to generate less concentration. Um, so we'll see if that has uh, any impact on the uh, on those individual stocks. But um, certainly, that could be the start of a little bit of a pullback or. I don't know, consolidation for the uh, the big cap techs. And that actually even makes it more important that the big techs um, generate good earnings. So just wanted to put that out there before we get to um, before we get to bonds. Uh, so Lawrence, um, you know, people are seeing great yields all over the bond market. Um, you know, you've been saying that maybe it doesn't make sense to reach for yield with more risk. Uh, but yet, based on how these markets are performing, it seems like people are doing that. Yeah, I mean, your, your question on the previous slide was probably a bit more appropriate than the question I have on this next slide about high yield uh, corporate credit markets. It's, it's, it can. I think I'm, I'm showing this because it continues to impress me how resilient the credit markets have been this year. In, in light of 5% uh, percent of interest rate hikes, we've had uh, regional bank crises, we've had debt ceiling debates. And yet these corporate credit markets are unfazed with everything that's going on in the market. So what we're showing here are spreads. Spreads are that is that additional compensation for owning riskier debt above what you could earn in the treasury security. The uh, high yield market broadly is yield is uh, has a, a spread of about 3.8%. So 3.8% above treasuries. At those levels, it's in the 35th percentile meaning spreads have been wider or more attractive 65% of the time going back to, to 2000. Uh, what's even more impressive is if you look at these triple C rated credits, that's that orange line and that the spreads over treasuries at 8%, that's in the 54th percentile over time. So again, and, and these triple C rated credits, these are the ones that are most prone to defaults and downgrades. And again, we're, we're seeing this market rally like I wouldn't have expected coming into this year, given everything that's taking place on the, in the macro backdrop. 
you know, we, we have started to see uh, downgrades pick up. So June was the seventh month out of the, the last nine where downgrades outpaced upgrades. We're, we're seeing defaults increase as well. Uh, so we, we have about a 2% default rate. The pool of, we'll call it default eligible securities, is uh, pretty elevated at, at current levels. So we could see defaults pick up to around 4% over the next 12 months. But spreads and yields, are they continue to move lower and, and they continue to generate really attractive returns. Now, to your point, Jeff, yields, all in yields are still pretty attractive. So we are seeing these yield buyers like these pension funds, these insurance uh, insurance, insurance accounts that are just kind of clipping coupons and uh, not really concerned about any sort of spread widening or, or near-term volatility. Uh, but for our tactical models, we've been staying clear of, of high yield. We just don't like the, the risk return uh, for these, these high yield credits over, a, say, a three to 12-month horizon. Another reason why that uh, that, that kind of scares me a little bit about high yield, the high yield corporate credit markets, and this is on the next slide, is that there's a lot of uh, debt that's coming due over the next couple of years that needs to be refinanced at these higher rates. So this is what we call a uh, maturity wall. This looks at the the uh, the outside, outstanding debt for high yield corporate issuers, and nearly 10% of the high yield universe needs to refinance its debt uh, by 2025. So we could see uh, again defaults and downgrades pick up because of these uh, these elevated rates. But for right now, markets don't care. It's been a great place to hide if you're a, an income-oriented investor or a total return investor. And um, you know it, it's amazing to me how resilient the high-yield corporate credit market has been, again, despite everything that's going on around it. Yeah, it's just one more data point that maybe the bulls can point to to say that we're going to get a soft landing, right? Or we're going to you know, maybe hold off recession until, I don't know, late 2024, uh, potentially, right? I mean, if the, cl clearly the bond market is not telling us recession's coming, even though there are some very credible signals that are saying the opposite, right? Yield curve, leading indicators, a number of things we've talked about. Uh, on yeah, this it depends before. on where you look. Yield curve right now, given the inversion of the yield curve, people would say that given the the, the level and depth of inversion, that is shouting recession is on the horizon. If you look at the corporate credit markets and the, and the fact that spreads are in these, you know, below average levels over over time, you're not getting any sort of uh, sense of concern about any sort of recession in the near term. And you look at the Fed funds future or, or what the markets expect the Fed funds rate to be uh, over the next, say, 12 months, it's not pricing in deep cuts. And you would tend to price in deep cuts if recession was on the horizon. Um, so it's yeah, we're we're getting different signals, but nothing that is that is in my view saying that recession's right around the corner. Yeah, it's also you know lending support for the argument that maybe this is a rolling recession where we have just you know different segments of the economy go into recession at different times, and so when you put all those pieces together, maybe you don't have a meaningful contraction because they're out of sync, but you're still experiencing a housing recession at some point, and then you're experiencing a manufacturing recession at a later point, and then maybe a, you know, modest consumer spending recession uh, down the road that can be offset potentially by some other factors. So, you know, that's not our house view. We wouldn't say we have conviction that that could happen, but it's certainly an argument that some, you know, really smart people are making. And, and I think it's fair to say that the market is pricing that in you know, maybe with 50-50 odds at this point, maybe even higher odds uh, because of, you know, how high uh, stock valuations are and frankly, how low uh, credit spreads are. So um, that, that's something to think about as we get into earnings season. Can we get enough good news uh, to continue to push stocks higher? That's our next topic. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, the answer is probably nuanced. Um, certainly, you know, we can't say no, they won't be good enough. Um, but I think the bar is pretty high for stocks to push another leg in this rally, uh, with, you know, valuations where we are, but, you know, Lawrence, you, I know you would say, uh, that investors aren't really getting compensated to go out on the risk curve for bonds, right? Well, we're saying this basically the same thing for stocks. Uh, you know, if the, if the stock valuations are very similar to bond valuations, then why would you pay extra to have that equity risk 
when you can get potentially similar returns uh, out of the bond market. So we still have a slight preference for bonds over stocks in our tactical asset allocation, uh, but we are uh, fully invested in both. So uh, with a little less cash. So um, here you see the trajectory of earnings growth quarter by quarter, year over year. And um, you see the estimates on the right-hand side, we're expecting based on consensus, let's say six to 7% decline in S&P 500 earnings per share. If we get the typical upside that we normally get, maybe we're looking at down four, but we're off to a pretty good start. You know, whether you look at companies that have uh, reported early, you look at guidance, you look at estimate trends, things like that, right? We think we can maybe do a point better than that, uh, but the ISM is quite weak. The ISM, uh, Institute for Supply Management uh, Manufacturing Index, historically does a pretty good job of predicting the direction of earnings. And that's pretty weak, right? I mentioned manufacturing recession. That's pretty much where we are. So if you, you know, maybe temper your enthusiasm a little bit for earnings because of that, <clears throat> you know, then you're talking about three to four points of, of upside. But that's still not terrible because if you take out the energy sector, you're up, right? The energy is driving a significant portion of this earnings decline because of the year over year uh, decline in, in energy, in oil prices <clears throat> and natural gas prices, frankly. So, you know, that's kind of the lay of the land. But if you look at this um, estimate trend, right, we're probably going to get uh, earnings growth either in the third or fourth quarter. We'll almost certainly get it in the fourth quarter. Maybe the third, call that uh, a coin flip. And I think one of the reasons the market's been rallying is because uh, investors and traders are anticipating that return to earnings growth. Um, and even though we we like international equities here too, they're not in their trough just yet. And we're already pretty much past it. The trough was was almost certainly Q2. So, so that's kind of a moderately bullish story, I guess. Um, the key to earnings is going to be margins because as inflation falls, companies lose pricing power, right? And if you lose pricing power, you might not be able to preserve the margin. So we could see some margin compression. That's something we'll be watching very closely when we uh, hear guidance from, from companies. So far, it's been fine, but it's only 30 companies. It's a little too early to draw a trend. So here are estimates, and then I'll, I'll let you weigh in, Lauren. So um, consensus is about 218 now in uh, S&P 500 earnings per share for 2023. We think there's a little bit of downside to that. Maybe most of that downside comes this quarter because, I mean, we're getting close enough to the end of the year. Maybe companies want to just, you know, be conservative and kind of, I don't, I don't want to say kitchen sink it, but just, you know, be a little bit conservative with the second half. It's still an uncertain economic environment. Maybe bring numbers down a little bit as companies typically do. And and then by the time we get to Q3 earnings season, the year's almost over. And I'm not sure how much further estimates can go from, you know, wherever they land in, let's call it uh, late August. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how well estimates hold up. Uh, again, guidance for the very few companies that have reported thus far has been pretty good, mostly. It's been some hits and misses, but it's been a little bit better than average. So that's encouraging. So, you know, if we come out of earnings season with 215 as consensus, I'll call that a win. What do you think, Lawrence? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think that it, it is an important earnings season, um, you know, and, and I'll just to put a, a fixed income lens on on things as well that, you know, from, from my perspective, we're paying attention to the amount of leverage out there, the amount of uh, interest expense coverage ratios that are out there. So, you know, the, I think that the equity guys get all the, the you know, the, the the earnings information, and that's what they pay attention to. On the fixed income side, we're more focused about can these companies continue to pay their bills, right? So we're, we are starting to see a, a slight degradation in some of these lower rated companies, Call it, you know, the the high yield universe as well as these triple B rated companies and within the investment grade universe. Uh, so now that we're presumably past the interest rate risk for some of these markets, credit risk and the potential for downgrades and defaults is going to be more prevalent uh, on the fixed income side. So uh, earnings are are an important stock driver for fixed income folks like myself. It's it's all about cash flows and and being and being able to pay back that debt when it's due. Uh, so that's you know something that that may come out of this earnings season as well that um, 
we might see some some weakening fundamentals on some of these lower rated companies, which again, the high yield market doesn't care right now. So we'll have to see if that changes after this earnings season. Yeah, you might see more of that if you go to like the Russell 2000 or at least the lower part of the Russell 1000, uh, I guess, because obviously the biggest companies are more likely to have the uh, the stronger balance sheets. But that's a great point, though, that we'll be watching for, um, you know, any sort of deterioration in fundamentals uh, for companies because, you know, people have been looking for more layoffs for a while. As soon as, I mean, tech kind of led the way, right, with the very high profile layoffs at you know, Meta and uh, Amazon and, you know, Microsoft, places like that. But it hasn't really been followed by another wave, right? So certainly we talked about this in this week's weekly market commentary, uh, which you can find on LPL.com, how, um, you know, layoffs and cost cutting, something that we'll be, we'll be listening for. Hopefully, certainly don't see too much uh, in the layoff category, uh, certainly, but cost cutting could help support margins, which are really important because we're probably not going to get much revenue growth at all. You know, part of that is because inflation is coming down, uh, but part of it is just because it's kind of a lackluster economic environment. Even though, you know, most economies around the world have maybe exceeded expectations, not China, <laughs> by the way, uh, but most co economies, certainly I think Japan, US and Europe have probably exceeded expectations that most would have had six months or 12 months ago. But we're still talking about a very sluggish environment, right? Including in China, <laughs> but certainly in Europe, uh, Japan, US, we're talking about maybe, you know, 1% growth kind of a pace, if that. So um, good good discussion there on, on earnings. Let's keep rolling. I got one, um, well, I got the week ahead preview, but one more point on earnings. I showed this last week. Uh, the The fact that earnings declines are more often met with stock gains than stock declines, right? The S&P 500 in years where earnings fall, which we're going to probably see this year, uh, the, the gains actually outpace losses by like two and a half to one. So you are much more likely to see stocks rise when earnings fall. And why is that? It's because they're forward looking. So market's looking ahead to, to uh, better earnings news ahead, certainly. So let's get to the uh, week ahead here, Lawrence, and uh, talk about the economic calendar. Uh, of course, we have a lot of earnings, too, that people are going to be watching closely. Uh, 60 S&P 500 companies report this week. Uh, there are some big names, mostly financials, um, but we certainly get some other big names outside of financials, including Netflix. So um, beyond earnings, though, it's, it's retail sales. I, I want to point out we try to point this out every time we show the retail sales numbers. These are nominal, right? Not inflation adjusted. But when we talk about GDP growth, we're talking about real GDP, right? Inflation adjusted, adjusted GDP. So, you know, five tenths sounds like a booming month, <laughs> but it's really not booming when your, you know, inflation rate is maybe, you know, 20 to 30 bips that you, it's still good if we can get that kind of number, whether it's X autos or, or not. Um, these are still good numbers. They're still positive, real uh, sales growth. Uh, but you know, I might say that there's a little bit of downside risk here. I mean, economic data has been beating expectations consistently in the US for months now. In fact, maybe we'll bring that to you next week. The um, economic surprise indexes that just measure basically the batting average, does economic data beat or, or miss economist expectations? US surprise index is surging. Right. I mean, it's about as as high as it gets. So maybe that would be a losing bet to say we're going to miss on retail sales. But that just seemed, you know, for all this talk, Lawrence, about consumers, you know, spending fading and, you know, um, I guess we don't have this the student loan repayments kicking in just yet. But there's a lot of reasons to think the consumer is is having a bit of a tough time here. Savings winding down. And yet, you know, economists uh, see a pretty solid number here. What what do you think gives? Yeah, no, I, I think to your point about the economic surprise index is is, is, a, is a good one, because if you look at the subcomponents for a lot of these uh, surprise indexes, it's not just one area of the economy that's surprising. It's it's broad based. So either economists are too negative about the consumer or the consumer isn't as in as bad a shape as as maybe we we thought they were. But um, the, the consumer keeps chugging along. And um, 
you know, as as a, a father of two daughters and and a wife, I know that we still get our Amazon boxes every day. So we're helping support the economy, I think. But um, it, it's been a it's been a it's been a good story for equity markets. Not a great story for the uh, the fixed income markets because that does tend to give the, the the Fed more confidence that they can continue to hike rates without any sort of negative repercussions. But uh, for for equity markets, it, it's been a good story. Yeah, it has. Um... Well, I'm I'm doing my part over here too. Uh, we've got painters painting our ceiling in in our uh, kitchen and family room today. So you know, kicking in a little bit for the for the economy there. Uh, after um, unfortunately, we had a little water seep through into the ceiling. It happens, you know, <laughs> especially with houses that aren't brand new. Uh, you've been there, I think, Lawrence too. <laughs> so it happens. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, the consumer keeps hanging in there. There's still some excess savings clearly that are still uh, out there providing some support. I mean, there's a little bit of credit card, you know, uptick in credit card usage, uh, that we're seeing that's, that's helping as well. Uh, but no doubt when you have a strong job market, you know, unemployment rate at 3.6, I believe still, you've got, um, you know, people who want a job pretty much can, can have one. And wages are still rising. Obviously, that's one of the things the Fed's worried about. So that sets up more consumer spending gains. And maybe we just have to, I don't want to call this a bubble, but maybe we have to kind of inflate consumer spending a little bit more before we can come back down enough to actually have a, a, a contraction, a potential contraction in consumer spending. We'll see. Hope not, but that's certainly uh, a possibility over the next, I don't know, three quarters, we'll say. So, um, I mean, I think the only other, I mean, leading index has been in recessionary territory for a while. So I don't think that's particularly interesting. I mean, unless we get a major surprise and it and it starts to tick back up again. Um, claims is always important these days because how tight the job market is, you know, feeds into wages and consumer spending, but particularly wages as we're worried about the Fed potentially going twice more. Our view is probably only get one, but we'll see. Uh, and then, you know, the housing data is interesting because multifamily construction helps the inflation story. Uh, I don't know if you want to make any comments, Lawrence, on on the housing market, but that's been, I mean, you can see in the starts numbers, right, that's expected to come down uh, quite a bit from the, the prior month. I mean, it seems to me like housing's been pretty resilient compared to expectations, especially yeah. at higher mortgage rates. Yeah, no, that's what I was going to say. I mean, the fact that we have 7% plus inter, uh, mortgage rates and we're still seeing the uh, the housing market, I don't want to call it recover, but maybe be as 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 uh, resilient as it is, is pretty remarkable. I think I read a statistic that, what, 90% of mortgage uh, mortgages have a 6% rate or lower. Uh, so there is not a lot of movement on, on the mortgage side, but for those individuals that are buying houses, that are taking out mortgages, it's not slowing really the, the mortgage market down that much or the, the housing market down that much. Yeah, I guess there's there's not a lot of inventory maybe because some people that might move uh, decided to just stick with their, you know, three, four percent mortgages, <laughs> right? I mean, it sort of creates this log jam where you don't have enough um, sellers, even if you might have buyers. Um, so yeah, that's something that, that'll work itself off over time, but we'll have to you know, probably get mortgage rates down. If our bond market calls right, Lawrence, we're going to have lower mortgage rates and that could help support housing, which was probably the the first area to go into recession. If you buy into this rolling recession narrative, um, that means it's probably coming out. And if you look at the home builder stocks, you can certainly uh, surmise that they were sniffing out the end of a housing recession and, and a pretty powerful recovery because those have been big winners this year. Yes, for sure. So anything else you want to uh, hit I was going to say I was going to say what's not on here is important as well that there's no fed speak this week. Thankfully. Ah. There's there tends to be too much fed speak in my view, uh but we're like they're in years. the fed is in their their blackout period uh in advance of next week's meeting which is going to be an important one. Uh but this week it's 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 going to be a quiet one for fed speak which is nice. You know, even even if I want to hear what the Fed has to say, I just find it very confusing when you hear from eight different people. 
<laughs> right. So am I alone in that, Lawrence, or does everybody? No, it, it, I, I get the, the reason why there was, there was a lack of communication during the Alan Greenspan days, and they wanted to make it more transparent. So Bernanke and Yellen, they all wanted to make it more transparent. It's gotten too transparent. You're, you're deliberating your ideas in public, and a lot of your ideas and your, and your thoughts are not consistent with the broader FOMC at times. So it does get confusing and it, it leads to more volatile markets, frankly, too. So um, I'm, I'm for one that maybe a speaker here and there, but we don't need to get all members of the FOMC out there talking their views every day. That's, that's, and that's my soapbox. So I'm not, I'm not crazy. Um, I'm actually probably in the, in the majority out there who, for those of you who follow all these Fed speakers, if you're confused a little bit at times, that's okay. Lawrence said so. That's okay. <laughs> Great. So uh, it'll be really interesting to hear what the Fed has to say next week. Certainly, we'll talk about that on the uh, podcast uh, in a week because we have the uh, next Fed meeting on July 25th and 26th. And man, July's flying by. We're already more than halfway done. So um, always enjoy the Fed meetings and hear sometimes obviously markets react negatively but i always find the fed meetings very interesting uh, even though i often say that i don't need to hear from all the fed speakers so um let's go ahead and wrap on on that uh, cheery note <laughs> so uh thanks everybody for joining thanks lawrence uh for uh for jumping on and and you know putting some fixed income with with my equities and and making a balanced podcast uh everybody uh have a great day thank you and we will uh, talk to you next time